We're going to be thinking about prayer this morning. Prayer is at the same time both natural and unnatural. It's both uh, easy and hard work. It's both simple and complicated. Let me explain. In one sense, prayer is so natural and simple and easy, everybody, even atheists, at times, find themselves praying. So you're in a crisis, you're at the end of your tether, and without even thinking, you find yourself, God help me. It just comes out. There's no preparation. You don't have to think about it. You just find yourself praying. Or perhaps you experience something wonderful. You see a glorious view. You just had a wonderful time catching up with friends. And again, you find yourself praising God, saying, thank you. But much of the time, prayer is not like that. It's hard work, complicated, and it doesn't come naturally to us. So if you're a Christian believer, you want to pray, you know that you should be praying, but you find it so hard to make the time. And then when you do make the time, you find that you're easily distracted, and you don't always know what you should be praying for. It's hard work to maintain concentration in prayer. And maybe we sometimes doubt whether our prayers really achieve much. Well, as we've been studying these uh, chapters in 1 Kings, we have been introduced to a prophet called Elijah who exercised a powerful ministry of prayer. And we first um, came across Elijah praying in chapter 17. At uh, uh, God's command, Elijah had gone to stay with this poor widow in Zarephath. And despite Elijah being a foreigner, this widow provides hospitality for Elijah and experiences God's miraculous provision of her needs. Her meager supply of flour and oil never runs out. But then one day, this uh, woman's only son gets ill and dies. And Elijah takes the boy and prays a bold prayer to God. We have it recorded for us in chapter 17, verse 20. Turn back a page in your Bibles and have a look at it uh, with me. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I'm staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. I mean, in all the Bible so far, there's never been a prayer like it. And God answered it, verse 22, the Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. And then last week, we looked at the the, the incident of the showdown between Elijah and and the prophets of Baal. And the contrast between the hysterical, ineffective prayers of the prophet of Baal compared with the simple, bold, confident prayer of Elijah couldn't have been greater. Look at it again with me. Chapter 18, verse 36. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. And again, Elijah's prayer receives an immediate and powerful answer. Verse 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. That is a powerful ministry of prayer, isn't it? A young boy brought uh, back from death and fire being called down from heaven. And we think that Elijah must be uh, such a great man, and in a sense, he was. God raised Elijah up for a specific purpose and used him and his obedience and prayers to turn uh, God's people back to a belief and trust in him. But as we heard from that first reading, the New Testament reminds us that Elijah wasn't a spiritual superhero. No, he was a human being just as we are. He was a man just like us. And actually in chapter 19, we see 
just how vulnerable Elijah was. He was suicidal. But James mentions Elijah to encourage us to pray. And as James says, the prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. And so as we consider how Elijah prayed for rain, we're going to learn a couple of lessons how our prayers, like Elijah's, can be powerful and effective. First, prayer is powerful and effective when we pray in line with God's plans and purposes. It's striking how confident Elijah is in verse 41 when he tells Ahab, go eat and drink for there is the sound of heavy rain. (laughs) It was a bold thing to say. There had been no rain for over three years and as Elijah spoke to Ahab, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. It was an extraordinary thing for Elijah to say, but it wasn't bravado because Elijah knew that it was God's will that it should rain. He had the specific promise that God had made to him. So chapter 18, verse 1. Back a page again. After a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. See, Elijah had been obedient to God. He had met with Ahab, and now he trusted that God would fulfill his plan. But notice how Elijah had to pray for God's plan and purpose to be fulfilled. The God of Israel, Yahweh, plans to send rain, and he brings it about through Elijah's prayers. And friends, this is a principle we see worked out again and again in the Bible. God declares what his plans and purposes are, and then he brings about those plans and purposes through the prayers of his faithful people. See, this is the huge dignity that God gives us. He wants his people to be involved in his work. He wants us to be involved in the outworking of his plans and purposes. And in this way, prayer works very much like the preaching of the gospel. Let me ask you a question. Could God bring people to himself without us passing on the good news of Jesus to people? Not a rhetorical question. What do you think the answer is? Yes, of course he could. God could do anything. He could send angels to do it. God could reveal himself directly to people through dreams and other dramatic means. And sometimes on occasions, we hear when God has done just that. But for the most part, the way that God chooses to reveal himself to people and give them eternal life is through the witness of his faithful people as they draw alongside others and explain and declare the good news about Jesus. And in a similar way, God chooses to work also through the prayers of his people. It's not the case that God is limited by our prayers, but this is the way that God, in his sovereignty, chooses to operate. He declares his will, his purposes to his people, And then he waits for his faithful ones to bring those purposes about through their prayers. So prayer is not about us trying to get a great God involved in our plans and purposes. No, prayer is all about how a great God evolves us in his plans and purposes. This is something that Jesus modeled to his disciples when he taught them how to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. We're not praying for our will to be done, but for God's will to be done. So let me ask you, what do you find yourself praying for most? Either when you're on your own or in your life groups. Is it for your will to be done? Or for God's will to be done? It's good to think about, is it? What we pray for our, 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 our children and our grandchildren. That they'll be uh, comfortable, happy, successful. What do we long most that they would be holy? Come to grow in a, a knowledge and love of Christ. Do we pray that uh, for ourselves and other people that they won't get, get to pass exams or get too stressed at work? Or do we pray that through the trials that come our way, God would refine us and make us more like him? See, if we want our prayers to be powerful and effective, then when we pray, and as we pray, we align ourselves with God's will and purposes. We remind ourselves of who God is and what he's like and what he's told us about what he wants. And we pray for that. And we see Jesus doing this himself in the, the Garden of Gethsemane. See, at a, a really deep and a, a on a highly emotional level, Jesus did not want to go to the cross. He wanted to be spared it. But he knew it was God's plan for him. And so as he openly and honestly poured out his heart to God, his heavenly Father, he prayed, yet not my will, but yours be done. Do we want God's name to be honored? Do we long for God's kingdom to come? If we do, and if we want our prayers to be powerful and effective, then we will be praying for those things that we know that God wants to happen. For instance, we know that God longs for people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so let's pray and continue to pray specifically for people to be Changed and transformed and converted. We know that God wants us to be conformed more and more to the likeness of Jesus. So we pray specifically about areas in our life and that of others where there need to be changes. And we pray that for our church, our denomination, our nation. We know that God wants more laborers to go out and work in his harvest field. So we pray for ourselves and other believers that we will be bold in sharing our faith and discipling people. It's not that we, we can't or shouldn't be bringing our concerns, our worries, our longings to God. No, of course, he is a, he is a loving Heavenly Father. He wants us to trust in him and depend on him in all things. But as our loving Heavenly Father, God also wants us to be directly involved in his a glorious agenda for mankind. So this is the first thing we learn from Elijah about powerful and effective prayer. We must learn to pray in line with God's plans and purposes. But there is a second lesson to learn as well. Prayer is powerful and effective when we pray with humble perseverance. So Elijah says to Ahab, go eat and drink, for there is the sound of heavy rain. And then we read in verse 42, so Ahab went off to eat and drink. But Elijah didn't do that. Instead, he climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Now Elijah's not doing that because he had a dodgy curry the night before. Nor is he exhausted from his climb up Mount Carmel. Although we're not explicitly told in the text, it's clear that Elijah is praying. But notice that we're not told anything about the words Elijah actually prayed. Instead, 
we're told about the attitude with which he prayed. First, Elijah prayed with great humility. He knows that he has no claims on God other than that which God has revealed to him. And it it made me think about the attitude with which I pray to God. Do I approach God humbly recognizing his greatness and my puniness and unworthiness? Or do I approach God you know, casually sauntering, so to speak, into his presence with kind of my hands in my pockets? Now, of course, it's not that our physical posture is important. No, it's the attitude of the heart that matters. But I do know for myself that sometimes when I'm praying on my own, it really does help me to get down on my knees or to stand up and raise my hands to God to express my unworthiness and my total dependence on him. See, if we're a Christian, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can approach God with great confidence. But we mustn't confuse confidence, I think, with casualness. Through Jesus Christ, we can approach God with great boldness. But we should also do it with great humility. The Bible repeatedly tells us, doesn't he, that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. But as well as praying with humility, if we want our prayers to be powerful and effective, we must also pray with perseverance. So there is Elijah praying to God with his face between his knees for rain to come. And after a while, he tells his servant to go and look towards the sea. Because that is the direction from which the storm clouds normally come. And so the servant toddles off to higher ground and comes back with the answer, there's nothing there. The Mediterranean sun is still blazing away in a clear blue sky. Nothing has happened. On the previous occasions that we uh, come across Elijah praying, the answer seems to have been clear and immediate, but not here. Why? We're not told. There is a mystery in prayer. God is not a genie. (laughs) Prayer is not like a slot machine. You put your prayer in and get your answer out. But notice how Elijah doesn't give up. He keeps on praying. Now, we're not told how long Elijah prayed for. All that we're told is that he sent the servant back seven times. But the impression, again, is given that it wasn't straightforward. Elijah had six sessions of prayer for rain, and nothing happened. He knew it was God's will, and yet God wasn't delivering. Elijah had put his life and reputation on the line for God. And God wasn't delivering on his specific promise yet. (laughs) See, that's the point. See, Elijah knew what God's will was. And although his experience seemed to say to the contrary, Elijah was patient. And he demonstrated his trust in God by persevering in prayer. And it was only after the seventh time that was the first little sign that God might actually be doing something. So if we want our praying to be powerful and effective, not only must we align our wills with God's and pray with humility, we must also persevere in prayer and not give up. And sometimes God will test and prove the genuineness of our faith by delaying in giving us what we ask for. Let me kind of apply this to the kind of current situation that we're facing within the Church of England. We don't know how the current crisis in the Church of England will pan out. We don't know whether in the years to come there will continue to be legal provisions and protections for 
Churches like ours at All Souls who want to hold on to what the Bible clearly teaches about marriage and uh, sexual intimacy, or not. So we must not be presumptuous and say that God must preserve biblical faithfulness within the Church of England. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We must humble ourselves before God and acknowledge that he is greater and wiser and more just than us. And it could be that it's God's will to bring our denomination under judgment. However, we do know that God longs for the gospel to be faithfully preached and that he wants his people to walk in obedience before him. So in the face of all the uncertainty and setbacks, we continue to pray for Jesus to be honored, for God's name to be hallowed, and for God to sustain us and provide for us as a church. And if it is God's plan for us to have a secure future as a church in the Church of England, God will work through our prayers to bring it about. And that is why last uh, Tuesday we held a, a day of prayer and fasting because it is our persevering in prayer which will reveal the true desires of our heart and is the mark of our faith in God. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He was. There was nothing special about Elijah. But there was something very special about the God to whom Elijah prayed. Because it was the sovereign will of God to send his eternal son, our Lord Jesus Christ, into our world to take on human flesh and to die on a cross. And the reason why Jesus died on the cross is so that we who are naturally unrighteous might become righteous in God's sight. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. If we have come to put our trust in our Lord Jesus Christ, then we are righteous. We can approach God in prayer with boldness and confidence. But if our praying is to be powerful and effective, then like Elijah, we must align our plans and purposes with God's. And we must pray with humility and perseverance. Let's bow our heads in prayer now. Our Lord God, our Heavenly Father, please so fill us with the knowledge of your goodness and your will that we will be a people who call on you in prayer, praying in accordance with your will, with humility and patient perseverance. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.